always trying to automate, automate. How can I automate a process that matters to me? So for many of you know, books matter to me. So we automated the process of selling books just all day long. We're just selling hundreds or thousands of books. I'm, I'm here, hundreds of thousands of books are going to be sold all around the world. I don't have to do anything. We set it up. I automated that process with online tools, with team. And so you got to figure out what are the processes that matter the most and can you set them up to just run versus you maintaining it, someone else maintain it or a system to automate it. So high performers are always automating those things. My yoga friend who said, oh my gosh, I'm so busy and underwater. I said, what do you do? Well, you know, I got to do this and this and this. Turned out she was going to Costco every Saturday, spending two, three hours at Costco because you got to go up every aisle. <laughs> if you did not know, I'm not allowed there anymore. <laughs> my wife took me one time and she was like, never again. I went up every aisle. I need to know what's in there, man. I'm, oh my God, what's in? I got to go up every single aisle. I'm the worst. You want to go to shop with me to get blueberries? Oh no. I'm going to go look up at everything. Look at the packaging on this. Oh my gosh. I told you I'm easy to distract. These like, you are not going. I walked in there. I said, look at all these things we need. She goes, we don't need any of those. I said, but look at that TV. It's bigger than ours. But our TV is fine. I'm like, but they have one. I, I'm a terrible shopper. I'm totally not allowed to do that. My, my, my staff, when we went down to Puerto Rico, took me to the Costco in Puerto Rico. Oh, they didn't know it'd be the whole day. <laughs> they had no idea. I had to look at all of it. Just, I'm terrible about it. I, I just, you can't have me do it. So I've always got to say, oh, what's the best use of my time? And get the support and the team and the tools to automate things and not be a browser on these other things. It's so important for you to decide what matters. I can't tell you what it is, but you already know. And how can you automate things that they're running and running and running? Back to the story of the woman at Costco. She's there every Saturday. I said, what are you doing there? She said, well, I have to go buy all the supplies for my four yoga studios. I go, do you own the four yoga studios? She goes, yeah. I go, do other people work there? <laughs> she goes, yeah. I say, well, why do you have to go get the supplies? Why don't you send somebody? I can't ask people to do that. <laughs> do you pay them? <laughs> well, yes, I do. Well, what is going on with you? Why, why do you have to control what you are controlling? Maybe write it down. Why do I have to control what I'm controlling? Look at all the things you're controlling in your life. Why does that have to be you? Why does that have to be you? It's one of the most profound questions in all of achievement. Why does that have to be you? Who said that had to be you? Why does she have to go to Costco? because she said she had to control it. But does she have to control it, yes or no? No! No, oh, but think of all the excuses she said. But if I give my credit card to them, they'll go buy everything in that store. I said, no, I would, but most people are responsible. <laughs> they're, they're, the people you're paying probably aren't gonna do that, and they give you a receipt too, so that's good, and it shows up on your card, you'd know right away, right? Well, I, yeah, I would know right away, and if they take advantage of it, you fire them, right? Well, yeah, okay, so we're good. Bases are covered. Bases are covered. You need to look at all the things you're controlling and ask, what if I removed, automated, or delegated that? What if I removed, automated, or delegated? What if I removed, automated, or delegated? What if I removed, automated, or delegated? And the second question then, what if I removed, automated, or delegated, that you get to ask yourself, okay, if I removed, automated, or delegated, like that shirt, what's the worst that could happen? What are they going to this in her situation? They're going to buy too much toilet paper. <laughs> What's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to buy some, you know, one of those things, the buckets of things that last seven months. 
That what, 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 what's going to happen? What's the worst that happens if you let go of some control? Who's ever quit a job in this room before? Ever quit a job, like a job with other team members on it? Who's ever quit a job? Raise your hand. Did any of you ever, who's ever been fired from a job? Okay. You ever notice the fired people make a different sound? <laughs> There's that weird laugh. They're kind of happy it happened, but kind of like, should I raise my hand about this? I don't know what this says about me. <laughs> you got fired? What does that say about you? <laughs> they always make a different noise. So if you've ever been fired or you've ever quit, has anyone in the room ever, and be honest, ever been, ever quit and left and everything ran fine without you and you were hurt <laughs> by that? <laughs> Raise your hand nice and tall. Look around the room. You quit and everything went just fine. The organization, like you hope the, you say, this place is going to burn. <laughs> this place is going to collapse without me. You go in a week later. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, how's it been? They didn't even know you, you quit. They didn't even know you showed up. <laughs> They're like, I didn't even notice you were gone. Isn't that the worst? They don't even know you were gone. It's ego that feels it has to control. It's ego. You need to find the things. The only, listen to this. Here's a crazy idea for your productivity. And I hope you guys are all with me on this because I know I'm being a little silly. But here's a crazy thing about my life. Everything that I control is my art and I love it. See, new team members come in sometimes. Brendan, why are you still writing your email to all the people every week? I love the people every week and I'm a writer. I like it. Well, sometimes you're not on schedule. I love the people and I'm a writer. Well, what somebody else could do it. Yes, but I like this part. And I should get to do what I like. Entrepreneurs, can I get a yes? But how many entrepreneurs in the room are doing stuff you don't like? Say, oh no. oh no. See, we want more yeses and less oh no's. <laughs> Way less oh no's. So everything I can, I'm, I have control in lots of things that I really enjoy and I really love and everything else I hand over here. I really think that could change your life, that question. What are all these things I control and why do I think I have to control them? What if I could automate that, delegate that, or remove that so that I could focus more on the things that really move the needle? I will tell you, it's how I got promoted faster than everyone else in corporate America. It's how by the end of my third year, my third year in the industry, by the end of my third year, I had created more online instruction than any of my peers combined. Now you go, what? How is that possible? Because that's all I did. Because I loved it. I knew that was a PQO. The second or third peer after me might have, like at our, you know, at our levels, if you will, in our industries I play in, they might have one, two, on average, maybe five online courses that might be pretty short. I've got 35 week online courses. People are like, what? The number of our millions of online students around the world. What? How? What, what, was it, what was so special about Brendan? Well, one, two, three, and four. That was what mattered. This is going to be a conversation about overall life happiness. Not just like in the moment, you know, happiness. Because in the moment of happiness, I mean, we can all kind of get that. A bottle of wine, bag of chips, I, I, maybe it's just me. But I think, we, you know, finding pleasure or joy or in the moment happiness, we can get there. We'll talk about that a little bit. But I want to talk about the big picture. How do we know what will give you enduring happiness? Happiness that you'll self-report throughout your lifespan that, yeah, I have a happy life. It's different than sometimes just in the moment happiness. It has to last longer. And so what psychologists have done is basically broken it up and said, you know, people who are happy over the long term, they tend to look at their lives in very specific ways. And here's how they tend to do it. They tend to break up their life. They look at their past. 
They're happy with their past. They're happy with their present, and they're happy with where they're going. So they kind of break it up into time zones, right? Past, present, and future. And here's what we found in each of those areas. If you look at your past in this specific way, you'll be more happy. If you look at your present in this specific way, you'll be happier. And if you look at your future in this specific way, you'll be happier over the long term. So let's start with your past, okay? Most people who are unhappy over the quality of their life over the long term, it's because something in the past, they're really hung up on it. They consistently battle it, blame it, are angry about it, are bitter against it. And those who are happy, they don't have that negative emotional range about their entire past. It's not to say that there might not be some things in the past that you can't be unhappy about or some things that happened that you were upset about because you know what happened to all of us. But those who make it out and have a, a joyful life, here's what they tend to do. When they look to the past, the first thing they tend to do is accept it. They're like, the past is the past. It did pass and here we are today. They don't make everything okay. They don't try to validate it. They don't try to say, well, that was supposed to happen. They just go, I got it. The past happened. I have to accept what happened because I can't change it now. I can change how I perceive it, but things happened. I'm going to accept that the past happened for some type of reason, or if anything, I, maybe I don't ascribe a higher reason to it, but I'm gonna say, in general, I'm good with the past. It, it happened. Today's a new day. And they accept the reality that that time period, that situation, that person, that thing that they didn't like, it's not here anymore. So they can't keep living there. They have to accept that today is today, all of that is gone. Today, they can choose a different life, as we'll talk about. So they accept the past. But here's the thing, they go beyond just acceptance. And this is really important, because I think people forget this all the time. It's not just about like accepting the past, okay, that's fine. No, happy people, they generate memories of fondness on a continual basis. They, they relive the past, not the negative things, but the positive memories. They think about it. Honey, you remember that one vacation we took? And they talk about it today. They, hey, do you remember when you were a kid and that funny thing happened and they relive the positive? They have, happy people, have a sense of nostalgia about the positive things of the past and they remember that and their con connection to that is more than towards the negative things. And so here's a question to see if you're happy with your family, with your friends, those around you, are you often reliving positive memories? They tell positive, nostalgic stories about the past without apology. They're not living there, they're not trying to go back and relive the glory days. They're just honoring and appreciating that those days even happened for them. They have a deep sense of fondness and yes, gratitude to the beautiful moments and memories and people and experiences they got to have. And so I know that might sound almost too easy to say because you know maybe in the past you went through some traumatic stuff, some very difficult moments happened. But by and large, if you can finally get to a point where today you go, okay, I, I don't have to be cool with everything that happened, but I accept the past. I'm cool. It's over. I am cool today and I like these little moments and I'm going to choose to focus and remember those and bring them up to people. Talk about those things, then I'll feel better about the past. And if you feel better about the past, you have a more solid foundation and a much easier time finding happiness today. Today, if you want to feel happy today, there's two things we know without question will get you to higher levels of happiness. Number one, connection. Connection. That is you deciding to connect to the moment, that means being present, and connecting to other people. You know, they've done a lot of those end of life studies to see what makes people happy. And you see over and over and over again, it's the quality of their relationships. And so if you wanna be happy today, put more emotional connection into your relationships. 
And I say that not philosophically. I mean, like, have that intention. Like, I'm gonna put good energy into this relationship today. I'm gonna put good energy into my kid today. Even if they were a jerk yesterday, I accept it, kinda cute. Today, I'm gonna just put good energy, good vibes into this relationship today, because if I do that, I'll feel better. If you're doing work and you don't even like the work, but at least you'll engage with it, you'll connect to the work, like you'll force yourself to be there, be present, be in it, you'll feel happier. The second thing today that you can do is so easy, is increase your appreciation. Almost in every psychological study ever done, those who had more gratitude reported greater happiness. The way that you get gratitude is you appreciate things. So let's just jump right to that. Start appreciating things better. Uh, appreciate your house today. You know, appreciate that maybe you got a car. Uh, appreciate that you, you had somebody in the house with you today who loved you. Or appreciate the fact that you have opportunities that all around the world people would just beg for. That billions of people don't have the opportunities that you do. I know we're all in a big rush. I'm guilty sometimes too of, of going through things as fast as I can because I got one thing, I got to go on another thing, another thing. But you know what? I found I'm most unhappy in life when that's what I'm doing. I'm just going on one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing and not feeling what I'm doing. Not really connecting it and not appreciating it. Like I'm right now, as I shared with you earlier as I'm filming this course, I'm writing a book. And there's days when I'm miserable about the book. And those days I'm miserable about the book are those days that I forget to connect with the material. And worse, I forget to appreciate the fact that I have the blessing to get to work on a book. I forget to appreciate how far I've come as a writer. I forget to appreciate the time that my team has set up to protect my ability to write. I forget to appreciate that God has given me a voice and I get to share that. And so I share with you that the most important thing you can do today, like stop thinking that stuff will give you happiness. Stop thinking that you'll achieve something today that will give you happiness. The only thing that's gonna give you happiness today, connection and appreciation. So connect to the moment, connect to other people by putting positive energy. Remember, bring the joy and then appreciate the little things, all the little goofy things throughout the day. Appreciate the opportunities that you have. You'll start to feel much happier, I promise you. Those are easy, quick wins in the moment. And then what we know for people who have the highest ranking of happiness, they look to the future in a unique way. And there's two elements there that they're usually looking towards. One, they're enthusiastic about something in the future. They're not optimistic. Optimistic would mean, you know, I believe stuff in general from today will turn out well. I believe that tomorrow is gonna be good. Happy people are enthusiastic about something specific tomorrow or in the future. Very specific. They like, they're enthusiastic about getting to do that project or complete that project. They're enthusiastic about that wedding coming up. They're enthusiastic about that thing gonna come out. They're in, there's something they look for, it's very specific. It's not a general optimism, though that also has been shown very, very high in correlation to happiness. One of the highest rankings, being optimistic, thinking things will turn out well. But really happy people, when they talk about the future, there's something specific they're excited about. So I ask you, what could you be excited about for tomorrow? What's hanging out there that you haven't allowed yourself to believe in and get stirred up about? Because, you know, we're so scared of being disappointed that we destroy our happiness. We say, I don't want to get enthusiastic because it might not go well. And so we cage ourselves into an unsatisfying life. If you want to be happy again, you have to open yourself again to the idea that things can be great. You got to open yourself again to that hope, that optimism. You got to open up yourself again to the possibility, yeah, you might be disappointed. But here's the thing, I always tell people, what would you rather experience? A life in which you don't do anything and you never look forward to anything because you're scared of disappointment, which by the way means you are continually living in disappointment. Or you say, you know what? I look forward to that. I think that could happen. I'm gonna go for it. You do take action, but at least if you do get disappointed, the whole time you are taking action, you are developing competency, knowledge, skill, ability, talent, mastery. So even if you got disappointed, you know what the disappointment came as? It came at the very end as a sudden surprise. I'd rather 
have disappointment come at the very end as a sudden surprise than every single day of fear and disappointment and living in that terror that I'm gonna be disappointed and doing nothing with myself. Don't know about you, but that's how I feel. So first, enthusiasm for a situation, something specific, it's so important. And then that next part about looking to the future is they have a sense of positive legacy. They have made up in their mind, and that's all they've done, they've made it up, because you, you and I, we can't read the future, we have no idea. But they've made up in their mind this story about their life having meaning, and specifically, a legacy. They see, looking into the future, they can see the legacy of their children. They can see the legacy of their business. They can see the legacy of the love that they created. They can see something. They can see that they are gonna leave some type of mark or some type of relationship or some type of situation where the world is better because they tried, because they showed up. And maybe you don't know what your legacy is, but you know what? You're never gonna suddenly realize it's not just gonna happen. You have to make it up. So if you're not happy today, start making up stories about what you can be excited about tomorrow and about what mark you might leave, the difference you might leave, even if you don't know exactly what it is. You don't have to have precision about these things. But in general, when you cast your eyes into the future, you go, mm-hmm, that's gonna be good. This has been so powerful when you've shared this on our morning show, and I just wanna share it with everyone here. Um, a lot of people are showing up here going, okay, like it's been a hard 14 months and um, you know, struggling with self-doubt, struggling, all the things. And some people have goals that they're trying to figure out with their career and all the other stuff. Yeah. But then there's also a thing called feelings goals. Yes. Feelings goals, right? So many of you guys, this is gonna be new for a lot of people. This is newer for me in my own life, frankly, right? Because you know, all my years of working as a Denny's waitress, trying to all the jobs and then all the re years of rejection with my business, when I finally got, you know, when we were finally getting momentum, I didn't feel the day. I just drove as hard as I could. And, and one of the things Brendan has shared so much about, and I would love for you to share with everyone live right now, is yeah, you can have goals in your fitness journey and in your career and all these things, but what about goals for your feelings, for how you feel and how you feel the day. Can you share? Yes. This is so powerful. I remember the first time I said this to her, feel the day. And she's like, oh, right. And we just, we had this huge, great talk about it because what happens is sometimes you're taking care of the kids, you're going through your life, you're doing the projects, you have the to-do lists and you're just going, going, going. And you finished the day. You didn't even feel the day. There's no reverence for life. There's no love. There's no heart. There's no spirit, no flow, no connection, no creative pop. And it's not because it wasn't there. It was just, you just... You just like blew through the day. You bullied the hours, I call it. And there was no moment of a pit stop to give prayer or meditation or gratitude or a second to go like, how am I feeling? Mm -hmm. Am I experiencing the, the energy that I want to experience in life? And that's again, we generate that. But feeling the day, I found the most successful people in the world. I remember we drew this out. I went to Jamie's house uh, almost two years ago, I think now. Yeah. And I, we were talking about successful people and there's drawing this little triangle and what everybody wants after they've gotten everything. After you hit your goals, you made the money you feel like your family needs. What you want is you want to feel the day more. You want greater depth in your relationships, like deeper relationships, deeper commitment, deeper meaning, right? We all want those things. And then we also want to know that we're leaving some kind of legacy or contribution, what I call meaningful pursuits. And I think feeling the day should be in your top one or two priorities every day. Mm -hmm. The whole mindfulness movement is really architected to, I want to feel the day. I want to feel presence, right? I want to feel the energy. I want to feel the spirit. I want a self-awareness or consciousness. It's a different feeling of the day versus just like powering through or caffeinating through it all and just blunting it out. We want you to have those sensations of beauty and honor and respect and, and depth every day. We want you to feel joy and reverence every day. She knows I, I probably say reverence every morning show because <laughs> I'm so happy. Who feels so happy to be alive? Mm -hmm. I'm so happy to be alive. I'm so happy to be with this woman. I'm so happy with this team and you all guys. It's amazing. It's a gift. Yeah. You know, um, 
I love that so much. And, I, and even Ed Milet was sharing a little bit about that idea of, you know, setting goals also for feeling the day. And then also like, how do, how, what are feelings we want in our life? And yes. I think you just named a big one too, which is presence. I think that um, it's been so easy, especially the last 14 months to like disconnect and just try to numb out and try to surf Instagram or watch the news or all the things, right? And so many people are saying that's really taken a toll on them, that they feel their own light dimming when they do that. And, you know, I started the morning off by talking about how that light is still inside of you, (laughs) that light in every single one of us, right? A lot of people nodding, it's still inside of you right now. And I think part of igniting it um, is learning to feel the day, right? So what what are just a few just simple tips people can do who are like, Brendan, how do I feel the day? <laughs> <laughs> I feel nothing. Um, part of it, to recognize your, your overall emotional feeling every day is usually a 72-hour after effect of how you moved, breathed, slept, and ate in the last 72 hours. It really is like it's a cumulative effect, especially of the last, the last 72 hours have a lot to do with your emotional world. So that's why having good habits on a consistent basis, like you might, you might listen, if you want to have a cheat day, that's okay. But that's why they call it a cheat day. You eat bad for one day, but then <laughs> like number two and number three, if you get back on the train, you start feeling good again, right? So it's okay to have one day off. But I think the most important thing for feeling the day is you need to have pit stops throughout the day. Mm. You need to have moments that you purposely take every day throughout the day to reconnect with spirit, soul, energy, or even just to breathe, mom, like just to take a beat, close your eyes. Like I do that. I'll stand. Like every, I do this every hour. Okay. I'll stand up. Sorry for the camera. Guys. I'll stand every hour. I stand up. You have, you've been asking me to demonstrate. Yes. Demonstrate. I will stand up. I will close my eyes because a lot of your fatigue is visual fatigue. And that visual fatigue is ta- causing a lot of neurological fatigue. So closing your eyes, especially because we're all these devices, close your eyes. I stand, I bounce in place. I swing my arms. I take 10 deep breaths like this. <sighs> 10 deep breaths like that every hour. And it re-energizes my body and my brain. And it's a little pit stop. And now my mental focus is back. When I open my eyes, I go, what's my intention for this next hour? Mm. And that little pit stop makes me go longer, just like a race car. It can go around the whole race, but it doesn't. It takes the pit stops to tune it up so it can go longer and faster and win the race. You need a little more pit stops to tune your mind up, amp up your emotions, reconnect with the heart or the spirit or the soul. And if you are just grinding all day, that is not, there's no pit stops. That's the equation for burnout. Yeah, well, so many people feeling burnt out, right? People that aren't leaving their home but because of the pandemic, but just so burnt out and so overwhelmed. And one thing you shared that I want to make sure um, everyone caught is uh, the idea of visual fatigue, because that was a huge aha moment that I had with you on the morning show just in the past few weeks. I thought, you guys, we implemented this at It Cosmetics. We grew to over a thousand employees and we would start ending meetings like five minutes before the hour instead of just back-to-back-to-back meetings, right? Because the idea that you can get up and just walk around and move your body. But one of the things you brought up is I learned I was doing them wrong because I was like walking and moving, but still engaged. I would take meetings in the hallway walking or I would check my email on that five-minute break, right? And can you just quickly share the idea that when you do take a pit stop, when you do take that five minutes, right? And this is hard for a lot of people, but... The idea is when you take that five minutes, the other 55, right? Or you take the 10 minutes, the other 50 are so much more alive. Yes. They're so much more alive. So people that say, oh, I can't afford to do that. No, no, no. You're so much more alive than those other 50. Um, But I was doing it wrong because I wasn't actually resting my mind. And you talk about the power of like visual fatigue. If you take a break and you're scrolling Instagram or emails, that's not a break. That's exhaustion, Mm -hmm. right? scrolling is just exhausting your brain even more and more and more and more. It's engaging it, but it's exhausting it more and more and more. And so it's, it's like this. You cannot possibly hope that burnout will end if you don't more consistently recharge. Mm-hmm. But we grew up on a century-old model that, oh, we'll get to recharge when we retire. Mm-hmm. We'll get to recharge, you know, two mm-hmm. weeks out of the year when we have vacation. It's why people are miserable 
because they're, the burnout is real because they don't recharge. They, they, one day I'll recharge the spa day or, you know, a year from now. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. You, the, the world's largest study of productivity that's ever been done found out the most productive people in the world who also reported high levels of happiness, they took a break on average every 52 minutes. Largest study ever done. Every 52 minutes they took a break. Did they need the break? No, they're recharging. If you're crashing at two and three o'clock in the afternoon every day, it's time to take a hint. You need to recharge at like 10.30, 11.30, or 1.30 to prevent the crash that happens two or three. The crashes happen because the recharges are not happening. Mm. And so the burnout will always be there. And I always say, make sure you don't blame the burnout on anybody. Please don't blame your burnout on your kids. That's not fair to them. Don't blame your burnout on the team. Blame the burnout on either ambition that is unmet with planning or just not taking care of and prioritizing your self-care or your well-being. You know, take care of you so you have the energy to serve at your highest levels. I think that is something we can all align with. Energy. Mental and physical and spiritual strength or vibrancy. I just call it energy in high-performance training. What is my energy? Do I have the energy to serve? Do I have the energy to focus? Do I have the energy to go to the gym? Do I have the energy to be nice to my spouse and my partners and my friends? Do I have the energy to do the work today? Like for me, when my energy is low or it is dipping, I always, always go, what is causing that? It's almost always two things. It's almost like if my energy dips low in the day, I always know there's two culprits. One, something happened that bothered my brain. I got annoyed frustrated or hurt by something. I got annoyed, frustrated or hurt by something. And it happened recently. It happened in the last day or two. And it's affecting my energy right now. Your energetic state right now is a hangover. Your mood right now is a hangover effect. Not always negative, it can be positive. But it's, it's an effect of something, right? Input, output, cause, effect. That's real. So I'm like, okay, well, what? What has hooked me? What has angered me? What has frustrated me? And then I'll do something like Byron Katie's um, teaching on the work. And I'll just flip the question or I'll flip the feeling. I'll say, okay, what would my life be like without that thought? Is that thought true? What's the opposite of that thought? And I'll just question those things that annoy me, frustrated, or hurt me. And then I'll do the physical work again of releasing those things. And if I need help with releasing those, many of you guys know, I love and invested in the tapping solution. So I'll just tap. I'll just go into my mind for those who know tapping and I'll just do a tapping routine. For those who want to learn tapping, you can learn it in the Growth Day app. There's a course in there on it already. And so I'll just do something physical to release that tension. But again, I said there's two reasons probably for my low energy. Is one, something mentally or emotionally, you know, it hooked my brain. And it's lowering the quality of energy I feel in life. The second one for me, which is big, is the last 72 hours of physical exercise and nutrition. It's like you feel right now what you consumed and how you moved in the last 72 hours. Most people think it's only during the day. No, the the food you ate three days ago, that's still in your body, the supplement, the nutrition from that, uh, the macros from that, whether you burned it off or not, the energy, the energetic effect culminates one day, two days, three day. And that's why sometimes people, if you've ever done a, a cleanse or something, you don't feel that much different in the first day or two, but by day three or four, you start like getting like this amazing clarity. Why? That 72 hour cycle of biology that we humans have. It's why when I know I'm going to teach a seminar to y'all, like I'm going to go, you know, like I've been blessed to, uh, a lot of the industry knows, we teach the single two hardest events in the world. When it was High Performance Academy and then Certified High Performance Coaching, these are literally nine hours a day on stage, often by myself, 
uh, and used to be, but now I've got a little smarter about it, but it was intensely difficult. And if you see me on stage, I'm not sitting like I am now in this little room in quarantine. I'm like bouncing the whole time. We're dancing the whole time. I'm running back and forth, the flip chart down in the audience, walking around. I do a marathon a day in steps, jumps, and movement, right? It's unbelievable. I got to eat three times the calories to pull off each of those days. And I can tell you when I'm on stage and I'm not feeling it, I don't go, wow, what just happened last hour? I'm like, okay, what was the last three days here? When was I moving? How was I recovering? What was I eating? When was I moving? How was I recovering? What was I eating? And I'll run that through over and over and I'll identify. I'm like, oh, you know what? There was that one hour after that stage, I was all hyped. I didn't eat. Or, oh, you know what? There was that time. You know what? I, I should have. I should have spent another 20 minutes uh, meditating or sleeping or I just run back. So I want you to do that. Anytime you don't feel well, I really want to cue you to develop the habit. This is like my advanced habit. If I don't feel well, I'm like, okay, 72 hours. What hooked my brain or my ego, maybe frustrated, angry, upset. Let me release that right now. That's the first thing, a release technique again. Second thing is, okay, have I moved and what did I eat? So it's like, oh, on Friday, I had those three glasses of wine versus that one. Got it. That's a lingering effect. Uh, okay, that's good. That's good to know. Or, oh, you know what? I really just wanted to cheat and I did, but now I'm really, I'm paying for it. And listen, I'm not here to judge anybody. Whatever you want to eat, consume, the stuff that you do, not my business. My business is Reminding you of wellness is experience of life and you have either defined what wellness looks like and feels like to you or you have not. And because I have, this is so important to me. I hate when I don't have this. Lacking energy to me is so painful that I structure my life to ensure I have it. I, I don't know about you, but I've laid in hospital beds for days. I don't know about you, but I've served in hospice and saw people who couldn't get out of bed and had their last breaths. I don't know about you, but I've had those times on stage or service or moments with family or friends when I didn't feel energy. And because I didn't feel energy, I didn't do a good job for them. And I hated those moments. I want to do a good job for people. And I think to do a good job for people, I got to care for my energy. And so I always tell people, if you haven't gotten healthy for yourself yet, do it for the people around you who are getting the shrapnel of your bad energy, bad energy, negative energy. There's shrapnel from that. There's emotional trauma from that. There's stuff from that that we got to make sure we release and not hold on to. And I know you guys know all this, but I hope it helps you. Your, the practice I have is a 72-hour assessment of my energy. Whenever I dip, I'm like, let me do my little 72 hours. Where was my ego hooked, annoyed, or hurt? Let me let that go. What was my fueling routine, my movement routine? Oh, no wonder I feel like crap. I've been sitting for three days. Oh, my back is mad. I forgot to stretch. I didn't open up my body and my breath with a workout, a walk, a bike, a run, a hike. I didn't move. No wonder. Oh, gosh, let me go. Come on, honey, let's go for a walk. And just get, get that movement back in. Get that movement back in. For those who've studied me with high performance work before, I recommend like a two by two or a three by three. Uh, all that means is like every, you know, twice a week, you do a, you know, high intensity workout at least twice a week or three times a week. You do uh, three times a week. You do a, you know, 60, I'm sorry, a two by two is once a week you do uh, a, a hit training and once a week you do a 60 minute Cardio training, that's a two by two. Um, a three by three is you're just adding more to that. So you're doing a uh, like a one, uh, uh, one session hit, one session long cardio, one session some other type of movement that you love to do that just opens up your body and gives you flexibility, maybe like a yoga or something. But whatever your routine is, did you move? Everyone knows the number one challenge to long-term health is nutrition and movement. Number one and number two. And people always say, no, 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 it must be sleep. I'm like, number one and number two are the greatest weapons you have for greater sleep. 
it is your nutrition and it is your physical movement that gives you the ability to sleep well. Now, guess what? When you have reverence for life and you're releasing that tension throughout the day, emotionally, letting go of that ego or that hurt, now you sleep like a baby. Like I've been blessed with sleep for a long time, not because it came natural, because I sucked at it. And I said, I got to get better at this. So I changed my nutrition. I moved more. I did more emotional releasing of tension. And those were part of my days. Remember, wellness is not something you do once in a while. It is the experience of life. You, you have to do these many times a day. Also, for those who've studied for a long time, with energy, every 45 minutes, I'm up. I'm bouncing. I'm moving. I'm opening up all the meridians on my body. I'm taking 10 deep breaths and bouncing in place and closing my eyes to rest. That energetic movement every hour, that breath work every hour, that opening meridians every hour, it's how I'm annoying all the time. It's like you're like, you just hang out with me like, wow, that guy goes all day. And he's just, he's in it all day. I had to train that. You're training your focus right now. You're training your energy. You're training your ability to serve. It's happening right now. And it happened last 72 hours too. You know, we're gonna have some fun today. We're gonna talk about your confidence. And I am really excited to break down a framework for you. And I hope in doing this, help you realize where some of those dark days come from where you lose faith in yourself. Where those dark days come from when you know you have a lot to do, but you just don't feel like you can figure it out. Where that, you know, when you get to go out in the world again, or when you're on a Zoom and you got to show yourself to the world, you feel awkward or weird or insecure, that you, you tap back into that authentic strength, that truth of who you are. And that as you go through your life, you feel confident that no matter what life is going to throw at you, you're going to learn, you're going to figure it out, you're going to develop your capabilities. And many of you are going through really hard times right now. Sometimes it's just hard to even be positive. You can be so consumed and so overwhelmed by the negativity of other things out there. You just go, oh my gosh, this is just hard to feel good, let alone confident. I'm going to break down a framework that I hope some of you are familiar with, but today we're going to talk about it in a, a, with a different lens of how to overcome insecurities and what specific daily and monthly habits you might set up for yourself to feel more strong. So this is a piece of paper. It's a framework for confidence that I have on a board in my office. See, we need reminders. We are visual humans. We need to look at something to remind ourselves of something. And so, you see, I have this, I'll share this with you in a minute, but I want to get the practice in your mind. The practice in your mind is you should have instructions to yourself on a wall somewhere. So you're like, if you walked into my office and say, Brandon, why do you have a framework for confidence on your wall over there? And I go, well, because sometimes I don't feel confident. And what do we do when we don't feel something? Well, when we don't feel something that we want to feel, we tend to feel not good because like, I don't feel this, so I feel bad about myself. Or we tend to distract ourselves. I don't like this feeling, so I don't know what to do. So let me just scroll through the internet. So to me, what I've done is I've got a board over here and there's my framework for happiness. Do you have a framework for happiness on your wall yet? So that when you don't feel happy, you go, I don't feel happy, what's going on with me? And you can just go look at it and you go, ah, I've got my checklist for happiness right there. I forgot point number three. No wonder I'm not happy. What I'm trying to suggest to you is maybe you give yourself a checklist, a framework, a set of instructions for the feelings that you really wanna experience in life. And when you're not feeling it, instead of retreating into the comforts of distraction, you go back to your instructions. You know what makes you feel good. And it's time to write that down and look at it more consistently. Here we go. This is my confidence checklist. This is my framework for confidence. I'm gonna break down each of these areas. And even if you've seen this maybe before with me, what I'd love to do is break down where these grow into trouble, where these are developed and strengthened, where these can be applied in your life financially, in your life, in your marriage or your relationship, 
with your partner, with the kids. So I'm going to break down each of those things, each of those areas. I'll use a, a card here for, for you. We're going to start with that very first card here. Clarity. Human beings are a goal-directed species. If we don't have clarity on what we want, if we don't have clarity on who we are, if we don't have clarity on what our intentions are in social relationships, it's it's unnerving to us. Well, if you ever felt lost in life, you know that feeling. It's coming from a lack, A, often of clarity. We'll talk about this. You just don't know who you are, what you're about, what you want anymore. And, and it's unsettling when you lack clarity. It's really unsettling. You're like, ah, I, 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 don't, I don't know what I'm about anymore. And this is where midlife crises come in. Clarity is something that's it's like knowledge or a goal or an aim, but it's loosely held. What I mean by that is like, okay, that's important to me, but I can be flexible and adaptive as well. It's not this idea that you have total 100% complete certainty and you're total certain all the time. Ah, it's like that, that is a adolescent dream. No, there is no absolute certainty in anything in life, right? And so we have to go, oh, okay, I, I can have clear direction or can be strongly committed to this thing, but lots of people who are absolutely certain about something shifts months later. So here's my question for you. On a scale of one to 10, in the last 60 days, how clear have you been about what you wanted in life? Did you start the day with some clarity about how you wanted to live that day, show up that day, treat other people that day, serve that day. So let's think about where sometimes you feel insecure. You're going to go to that party or that networking function. You feel insecure about yourself. Why? Because in your mind, the insecurity in, in that moment, in that situation of the networking situation or the party is coming from I don't know who I am in here. I don't know these people and who I'm supposed to be with them. I don't know where to go or where to stand or, or who to talk to. And so just, it's unnerving. The insecurity is, I don't know what to do in this situation. Now that type of confidence or lack thereof is something that psychologists call self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is about, I don't know what to do in this situation. That's where the insecurity comes from. Positive self-efficacy self means I believe that I know what to do in the situation. I can handle this. Even if I don't know how yet, I believe I can handle this. I have the competence to take this on, as an example. That's positive. But a lot of things in life you don't know how to deal with. You don't have self-efficacy because you don't know how to handle it yet. This is a new party. You don't know anybody in it. It's a new networking event. You've never met any of these people. How do you get more confidence in that? Well, one simple thing you can do is start with clarity. Like, okay, I'm gonna go talk to people. What's something I'd love to share about myself with every new person I meet? Oh, okay, lock that in. Okay, got it. What's one question I could ask every new person I meet? Okay, let me lock that in. Okay, just those two things have been found to dramatically increase people's sense of confidence in social situations. I know what I'm gonna share about myself, I've clarity on it. I know what I'm gonna ask them, I've cleared up. Just those two simple things. The problem with clarity is it's a double-edged sword. A lot of people, their clarity is, I'm awful, I'm worthless, I'm no good. And they've stacked up all these experiences to strengthen that belief. And their clarity is, well, I'm a jerk. I don't deserve success, I won't have success. They've got clarity, but they got the wrong kind of clarity. See, confidence requires positive clarity, not negative self-defeating clarity. So clarity is a double-edged sword. If you believe the wrong thing about yourself, that's going to hurt you too. So what's the opposite of that? Well, I'm going to start viewing myself positively. How can we do that? Well, you know what? Maybe each day for the next 10 days, I'm going to write down a strength that I have. Write down 10 positive things about yourself every day for the next 10 days. Watch what happens for you. It starts shifting your perception of yourself. Here, my little framework, we're going to go from clarity now to congruence. Congruence is living in alignment with what you know is the best of you.
living in alignment with the best of who you are, living in alignment with your values, when you are not congruent, your brain logs that. And what it says in that log, that log entry, not living your word, not living your truth, not doing what you said you would do. And too many of those negative withdrawals sucks away your confidence. But here's what you need to be congruent. What do you need? Clarity. You say, okay, these are my values. These are my beliefs. This is what I think is important as a human being, as a parent, as a caregiver, as a leader. Congruence measures whether or not you're doing what you said you're going to do. And that's important. So here's the simplest fix. If you're been pulling too many withdrawals out of that bank account, it's time to put some back in. And so today might be the day you go, where have I been incongruent? Where do I say something and I don't do it? Where are you out of congruence? And can you do the simple acts? Sometimes when you're out of congruence, first you just apologize to yourself. You say, you know what? Gosh, Brendan, I, I haven't been honest with myself. Let's make a change. I think the fastest path back into congruence is an apology. An apology to yourself, an apology to other persons. It takes a lot of guts to say you are wrong. It takes a lot of guts to acknowledge you could do better. This one's fundamental. You get to decide today what to be congruent with. You get to decide who you are and you get to decide to show up and live into that. Third big idea, competence, right? Competence, it's a collection of knowledge, skill, talents, and abilities. The good news is you can increase this. So here's what I want you to do. Every day, every day, I want you to have clarity on what skills you are working on in your life. That's how we're going to get competence. Competence for too many people comes two years too late. Why? Because they wait too long to start developing a skill. Every day, I'm very clear about what I'm trying to improve. Every day I'm learning something, but I'm learning not just casually or, or passively. I'm going, I'm trying to get better at this thing. I want you all to have an ambition to have one or two or three skill sets that you're literally world-class in, that you're world-class in. Not because you need the ego that I am world-class. No, no, no. Because you need the challenge. You know why a lot of people lack confidence? They never engage challenge. You want more confidence? Engage and challenge more often. The more challenge you engage in and you incrementally improve in it, the more your brain goes, yep, there I did, I did it again. And what happens when you don't have confidence, you don't engage in challenge. When you don't engage in challenge, you don't get more competence. So you don't get that competence, confidence loop we were talking about, the flywheel. Y'all follow? So for those of you, if you're like, but I just lack confidence, like challenge yourself more. But you're like, but I'm lacking confidence. I'm like, exactly, exactly. See, it doesn't, you, you're going, well, I'll get confidence. Then I'll do the challenging things. I'm like, the other way around. The other, you want more confidence, do challenging things more often. When you do challenging things more often, you learn. When you learn competence, confidence, connection. When you don't have a connection with yourself or others, confidence goes down. So you want to feel more confident in life? Reconnect with yourself and others. With yourself, that's your morning routine. Lock in that morning routine. The more you feel connected to self, the more confident you are. But you need the time to connect to yourself away from the email, the social media, the obligations for the kids, the family, the husbands, the spouses, the team, everything else. You need that moment where you're like, out and connecting with yourself, with your thoughts. You need time to think and to feel again. So turn off the TV, go for the walk. Put down the phone, do the meditation. Get away from the, 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 the social thing one, you know, 10 minutes earlier so you can sit in the car and just think before you go home. You need more space 
to be thinking and connecting with self. So build that in your life, self-connection. Second part, the most important part, we know environment dramatically shapes your confidence, the connection you have with the people around you. This means be around positive people, contribute around positive people, learn from positive people. It means create great relationships in your life. I want you all to improve this one, simple action, simple daily, weekly, real life action. You must start sharing your real thoughts, feelings, desires, and goals with the people around you. You got to do it more often. Here's where you lack confidence in life. When you won't share your truth because you're worried what everyone else thinks. That's what high schoolers do. You don't do that anymore. You're too damn old. Now you share your truth with other people and realize most of them won't get it, won't understand why it's important, won't support you, won't care, or at least won't get in your way and say anything at all. But the less you speak your truth to other people, the more superficial your connections are with them. Number five is capability. Competence is the knowing, the knowledge, skill, talent, ability. Capability is you can do it. You can do it every time. It is like a strength, if you will. It is something that is you are highly capable at that thing. You are at another level of skill that it shows up every single time. But here's the truth. Capability, capability is as much as a mindset as a competence. Let me give you an example. A lot of extremely smart people who can handle the problem don't handle the problem because they don't feel capable. It's like, yeah, I know it, but I don't do it. See, there's a difference between knowledge and execution, which is often the difference between competence and capability. See, competence is like the foundation and a stored value, but it's expressed through execution, capability. You wanna develop capability? It means you get in the mix, you do the work, you show up, you try. Capability means I know I will execute. That's what to me, confident capabilities. I know I will execute. How do you do that? You have to be more consistent in your execution. You need to be way more consistent in your execution. We talked about decision earlier. Decision is great. Action is required. We've got to get you to execute more of those to-do lists. You want more success? You want more joy? You want more confidence? You got to execute more of the plans. Capability is self-trust to take the action. It's not just, do I know how to take the action? It's, I'm, go I'm, a, I'm an action taker. I'm going to show up. I'm capable to handle this. I will do this. I trust in myself to handle this, to execute, to execute again and again and again and again and again. That's capability. And I really want you to develop that in your heart and in your soul by checking off the simplest of things each day. By If you have a list of three to-do lists, if you wrote down your three top priorities for the day, do those first before you do your social media. Before you reply to everyone's DMs, inbox, uh, you know, uh, voice message, texts, it's like, listen, I have so many people who uh, they spend all day just checking their email to reply to everybody else. Now that's fine if that's your job. If that's customer service, do that. That's your job. But if you're an entrepreneur, as an example, or you have a whole list of other priorities and you're just checking into other people's agendas all day to meet all their obligations, and you keep missing your key priorities day after day after day after day, your brain doesn't feel like you're capable anymore. Even though you might be smart, you're competent, but your brain doesn't believe you're capable. Last big idea today, contribution. You want confidence? Give more. You want confidence? Make your difference. You want confidence? Do things that matter. Why? Because A, those things are celebrated in the world. Generous giving people tend to have greater what? Connections with other people. Generous giving, caring, hardworking people tend to have what? More clarity about who they are. 
they're more congruent. These things, they feel more capable. Like generosity, doing things that matter, giving strengthens the whole rest of the model. The whole model drives itself when you've got each of these pieces running, right? Each of these pieces touches one another. Contribution's a key. It really is. Sometimes when you feel so bad about yourself, you're not going to shake yourself out of that. But what can shake yourself out of that is service. Sometimes you got to get out of your own head. And to me, what has created a great confidence and reverence for life in my life has been, I've been volunteering most of my life. When you're a volunteer, when you show up for others, when you volunteer to help out, whether it's as simple as helping a friend move or going down to the local soup kitchen or volunteering for that nonprofit cause that you like or, or running that fundraiser, even though you don't know how, those contributions make a difference. Maybe your contribution is your art. Maybe your contribution is your time. Maybe your contribution is financial. Maybe your contribution is mentorship. Maybe your contribution is your content or your book or your work, whatever that is. If you can do the same thing where you can, where you can give generously to it, give to your work, be generous to that contribution, be in the moment in when you're serving someone who is in need, you get a little more spirit inside. And when that spirit of goodness is inside, you can share it more too. This can be your day for personal growth. This can be that day you committed to and you remember and you go, that was the day I got myself a community. I got better coaches. I committed to making my life the absolute best that I could. This is that day. Make today your growth day. Click the button on this page and sign up right now.